Um, and now I want to bring up someone who has achieved the near impossible, getting elected to the Congress from New York State as a sincere, out-of-the-closet conservative, and that experience may provide uh, real lessons for the rest of us. The Honorable Anne Marie Burkle joins us. Thank you all and good morning. It's an honor to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you, Tucker, for that kind introduction. And yes, it's true. There are conservatives in New York State, and we are proud to be there. Before I begin my comments this morning, I would just like to ask all of you to pause and remember and keep in your thoughts and prayers the men and the women who fight to keep us safe so that we can be here this morning. We thank them, we thank our veterans, and we thank all of our military for their service. As all of you know, 2012 was not a banner year for Republicans and or conservatives. And as we reflect on the 2012 election, I want to just talk about a couple of things. First of all, what we know. We know very well now that we were beat soundly at both the uh, social media and the ground game of Barack Obama. Compare the RNC's phone banks to the sophisticated plan of social media from Barack Obama, and you begin to understand what the Republican Party was up against. The other thing we know is that, and, and as Michael just mentioned, turnout, Republicans lacked enthusiasm. They lacked energy. The discussion about why that is, that's for another day. But for right now, we know in my own county, Barack Obama won in a, in a county, in a town that had a 20% Republican enrollment favored, Barack Obama won that town. So we need to understand and we need to look at why that happened and why we did not energize the Republican voter. What you may not know about the 2012 election, which I think uh, really is something to understand, was that, and I look at my case, but in talking with all my colleagues who lost, the campaigns that were run against us were national campaigns. So my opponent was virtually muzzled. He had an opportunity to debate, to debate me eight times, chose only to do that twice, and was virtually silent during the campaign. The campaign was one run by the DCCC, the Teamsters, SEIU, uh, Michael Bloomberg, George Soros, his son. You name it, they ran the campaign. And what they did was, and this is a lesson for Republicans to understand what they're up against, they employed the use of fear. Fear. Uh, and, and as you well know, the war against women was first and foremost in their whole platform in running against someone like me. So I want you to think about this just for a moment. I am a woman who graduated from high school in the 60s. I am the proud mother of six children, four of who are girls, 13 grandchildren, four of who are granddaughters. I graduated from law school and at the age of 43, after I had my six kids, first woman to ever hold the seat in Congress from my district. And yet the, the, thank you, what they portrayed me as was someone who was anti-woman. Now, it, it is, it is laughable, but they did it successfully, and they did that by employing fear tactics, by, by making the voters afraid of what I would do, and that's so significant. The Democrats are employing behavioral psychologists, and the Republicans don't understand what they're up against. So they employ fear and they employ guilt. Those who of us who are successful, they want to make us feel guilty. And those are very two important, I think, very important th facts that the Republican Party needs to get their arms around. So really the question this morning is where do we go from here? What are we going to do about this situation in this last election? Number one, first and foremost, the Republican Party cannot be afraid of change. In fact, if they don't embrace change, if they don't understand that they need to, to get away from the status quo, the party will become extinct. They, have to, they really have to learn how to inspire the American people, how to tap into that human spirit. And with all of the respect that I can muster for the party, they have to understand that the days of the good old boy party the days of the establishment Republicans are forever gone. <laughs> Women, minorities, Latino, African Americans, in fact, all Americans are looking for a party that inspires, 
a party that gets that human spirit going. Just think about what Rand Paul did last week in his filibuster. He inspired the American people, the millions of tweets, the excitement that that one single act generated. That's what we need to do more of. And that's what the Republicans need to understand. The Republicans need to embrace these groups of people and make them understand that they are a vital part of the party. And we cannot be courting minorities or courting the African American vote or courting the women's vote just around election time. These groups are vital parts of the Republican Party. They need a party that they can look to, that they can be excited about, and the Republican Party needs to change its ways and embrace all of those groups as a part of the American fabric and, and what they will need to do to become successful. The other really important thing and, and what I feel so passionate about is that the Repu you'll hear many talking about what the Republicans need to do to win elections in this country. And one of the things you hear is we need to moderate. We need to move more to the center. We need to abandon our conservative principles. I believe that that's absolutely the wrong way to go for the Republican Party. The strength of the Republican Party depends upon our conservative principles. The, those principles are the essence of what connects us to the American people. That is America, those conservative principles. That is consistent with our founding fathers. That is what makes this nation the greatest nation ever. Now is the time for us to really emphasize and, and make every American believe that our beliefs are what will, will make this country better. We are a party for all people. We believe that the greatness of this nation doesn't lie in that big bloated bureaucracy in Washington. The greatness of this nation lies in every individual American citizen. That's what makes this country so unique. That's what makes this country the greatest nation. We need to distinguish ourselves from the middle and, and from the progressive uh, left. We need to emphasize the individual, emphasize personal freedom, emphasize smaller government. And that is the way we will turn this economy around. That is will, how we will get this nation back on track. We're not going to settle for trillion dollars of debt. We are responsible. We want to make sure that our kids will get a better America that, than, we, uh, than we were handed. Now is not the time for us to apologize for being Republican and or conservative. We should embrace those principles. We should be proud of those principles. We should, that's right. <laughs> and in fact, when we do that, we embrace the principles of Ronald Reagan, Abraham Lincoln, consistent, principled conservatives. That's what this party is about. We can't move to the center. We need to be solid and we need to be firm in what we believe in and what we stand for. In doing so, and I'll end on this note, by adhering to our conservative principles, that is how we will win elections. And more importantly, and the reason all of you are sitting in this room today, is we will have a better United States of America. Our children and our grandchildren will have access to more opportunities than we had. And we will hand off to them a better place, a better country, a country that's not laden with debt, a country that has a, a, a clear direction. That's what our legacy should be. So I'm so pleased to be here with all of you this morning because I know you love and you care for this country. And I thank you for all you do for the conservative cause. May God bless all of you who love this country. May God bless our military. And may God bless the greatest nation in the history of the world, the United States of America. Thank you.